Hello everybody. This will be a brief video trying to explain the importance of the Iliad. Before I get there, let me explain to you why I'm even talking about the Iliad. So in chapter 3, which is a very fascinating chapter, we are introduced to the Pelagian Graves. The Pelagian Graves clearly are of enormous proportions compared to normal graves today, which automatically should bring up the question, why would they need different proportions for their graves? Now, Dan Sushano speaks a little about cultural beliefs and size of peoples and beings and the gods and so forth. But that's what makes it so challenging. That's what makes Chapter 3 analysis so challenging. Let me demonstrate. Okay. So as you can notice, page 189, the Iliad is referred 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 times. Page 190, nope. 191, twice. 192. 12 times it's referenced. More than 12. It's probably like 20 times or more. Page 196. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So clearly for Dan Sushanu, the Iliad written by Homer is very important. In my case, I was trying to put together a chapter 3 analysis video and I got to page 189 where it says before the city Troia the poet Homer tells us there's a tall isolated hillock which someone could surround from all parts hillock which the people call Batiea and the immortal gods the grave of the heroine Murina now this is the part that I was looking for, the grave of the heroine Murina, because that's the reference from the Iliad. Now, when I go to normal Google search, and I just literally type in the grave of the heroine Murina, what appears? Nothing. Oh, you get a reference to to uh, dances. Just in case you didn't know, there are other translations of the book out there. I just don't know how accurate they are, and they are not my interpretations. Therefore, if you want to go ahead and read that, go for it. If you want to stick around with me, that's okay too. Anyway. Oh. Anyways, there is nothing that appears, nothing worth reading anyways. So at that point, I'm like, okay, this is the first reference on page 189. So I looked at the specific location. So it's first reference, the Iliad, the two represents the book. Now, okay, I guess I'll just show you. So you can type in the Iliad PDF. And no, 
just the Iliad. Go to Wikipedia. And at the very bottom, you get a references section. And this is true for most books nowadays. Try clicking on the first one, see what happens. Dang it. I don't have the patience to do this right now. Eventually you get to this link. I'll leave this in the description or the first comment. Anyways, the idea was book 2, line 811. So let's go to 811. And here it says, both footmen and charioteers, and a great din arose. Now there is before the city a steep mound afar, cut in the plain, with a clear space about it on this side and on that. This do men verily call Batiea, but the immortals call it the barrow of marine light of step. Okay then, so Barrow of Marine, that doesn't sound like the grave of the heroine Marina anymore, does it? Barrow of, how'd you spell that? Barrow, oh, so see for this. All of a sudden, we have a connection. Marina. In Greek mythology, the name Marina or Marine may refer to the following individuals. First one, Marina, a queen of the Amazons. Wait a minute. The Amazons. Who are the Amazons? If you read the book uh, about the barbarian origins, by Niccolo Zeno. Let me see, is there an English version? Should have looked into that, huh? Anyways, the guy is Nicolo Zeno. He was a Venetian. Apparently, his family had 1,000 years of history. Yeah, we don't, it's not listed here. Interesting. But in in Romanian it would be like there. I have to download it. What the heck?
Anyways, this guy wrote a book called About the Barbarian Origins, in which he speaks about the Amazons. There is also Jordanus, who wrote the Jetica, who also speaks about the Amazons. The Amazons are literally the Jetai women. And <clears throat> what is so special about them? For whatever reason, the men left. When the men, when the, when the men left, obviously they remained in control. In fact, they became so powerful. At one point, they controlled minor Asia in its totality. And I'm not sure who said it, but apparently it might have been this Nicolo Zeno guy. But apparently, they had a reign in minor Asia for up to a thousand years. This whole area from the north, the south of Thrace, into the Troas, which is where the Trojan War took place, also known as Ilios, also known as Troa, also known as Troy, Troya, and uh, what was it? Land of Deep Soil. <laughs> And I found that very interesting. The same lady, Queen of the Amazons, clearly, in my mind, given my research, Jetai woman, similar to Queen Tomiris, who stopped the Persian invasion of Cyrus the Great. Anywho, he says here, according to Diodorus Siculus, she led a military expedition in Libya and won a victory over the people known as the Atlanteans, destroying their city Cerny, but was less successful fighting the Gorgons, who are described by Diodorus as a warlike nation residing in close proximity to the Atlanteans, failing to burn down their forests. During the later campaign, she struck a treaty of peace with Horus, ruler of Egypt, conquered several peoples, including the Syrians, the Arabians, and the Cilicians, but granted freedom to those of the latter who gave in to her of their own will. She also took possession of Greater Phrygia, from the Taurus Mountains to the Caicos River, and several Aegean islands, including Lesbos, she was also said to be the first to land on the previously uninhabited island which she named Samothrace, building the temple there. Uninhabited, that's a lie. Just look in the name, Thrace, T-H-R-A-C-E. The Thracians were there already, the Samothracians were there. Anywho, the cities of Merina in Lemnos Possibly another Marina in Mysia, Mytilene, Syme, Pitana, and Priene were believed to have been founded by her and named after herself, her sister Mytilene, and the commanders in her army, Syme, Pitani, and Priene, respectively. Marina's army was eventually defeated by Mopsus the Thracian and Sipilus the Scythian. She, as well as many of her fellow Amazons, fell in the final battle. Okay. I need to do more research on this final battle of the Amazons, but the fact is clear based on my research. This was the area of their rule, Minor Asia. So when it says she fell to some Thracian guy and a Scythian guy, well, that implies... A coalition from the west side of the Black Sea or the Pontus Sexinus, leading up all the way north 
to the upper end of the Black Sea. So we're talking about a large area of land, forces working together just to overcome this lady. And why would they want to overcome her in the first place if she was the same, the same um, bloodline as those that supposedly kill her? Either we're being lied to by by Wikipedia, or or. Something happened that caused her to fight her own peoples. Hard to say. Who knows? Other possibilities for this person. Marina, a person whose tomb in Troad, mentioned in the Iliad, see Batea, was identified with Marina the Amazon. Now you can get lost looking for this as well, what Batiea is, what the Troad is, so on and so forth. In fact, that's what I've been doing. I have been getting lost. In fact, I was so impressed by the fact that Dan Sushan chose to use so many references from the Iliad that I started to read the Iliad myself. And as you can see, I'm up to 75 slides already. This is just like a rough outline because I need to organize this stuff together to put together a coherent message. But why is the Iliad important for this reason? It is the real Titanomachia. Now, to understand this, you have to understand Titanomachia was a 10-year series of battles fought in Thessaly consisting most of, of most of the titans and older generation of gods based on Mount Othris fighting against the Olympians, the younger generations who will come to reign on Mount Olympus and their allies. This event is also known as the War of the Titans, Battle of the Titans, Battle of the Gods, or just the Titan War. The war was fought to decide which generation of gods would have dominion over the universe. It ended in victory for the Olympian gods. Now why, why, why do I make the link between the Trojan War spoken about in the Iliad and Titanomachy? The idea came to my mind when this was said. A 10-year series of battles fought in Thessaly, consisting of most of the Titans. Well, okay. Obviously, I started reading the Iliad, lines 1 to 32, book 1, each and every single one of these. Okay? And... Everything that stood out as characteristics that are worth keeping in mind, I try to make a list of it. Like, for example, Achilles is talked about. Book 1, line 1, son of Peleus. Multiple lines in book 1. He's referred to as swift-footed Achilles. Wait a minute. Why would swift-footed matter? I'll get back to that perhaps, in a further future analysis video. He's said to be dear to Zeus. He's said to be godlike. He's the son of Peleus. Obviously, I research who is Peleus, but I'm not sure Google tells me correctly. His home is Thea. He, his ships are beaked. 
the other ones are referred to as black ships mostly or like swift ships but his are referred to as beaked ships he's a king nurtured by Zeus he was king of the Myrmidons I believe I think Myrmidons yeah oh there we go Lord of the Myrmidons he carried the stuff the staff studded with golden nails what does that tell you they he lived in tents the Myrmidons lived in tents the tent people you may have seen a lot of old maps where you see tents instead of houses or castles. You may ask yourself, why? Why tents? His mother sits in the depths of the sea beside the old man, her father. Came forth from the sea like a gray mist and sat beside Achilles and talked. How is this possible? How is his mother part of the ocean, but then she separates herself from the ocean? So there's a lot of question marks that that are brought up. Agamemnon. I don't know if you can see that or okay. Let's try this different. So clearly I have to format this further. Anyways, Agamemnon, son of Atreus, his house is in Argos. His daughter, wait, let me, let me rephrase that. Daughter of Christ says, walks to and fro before the loom and serves my bed. So Agamemnon is the king of the Achaeans, Achaeans of the Greeks, if you will. He's the bad guy, but he's the good guy. He is white ruling, eyes like blazing fire. Prefers daughter of Chrysus over his wedded wife Clytemnestra. He is of the Argives. He is the most glorious son of Atreus, most coveted of all. He is dog-faced. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Agamemnon is dog-faced? His face is like that of a dog? Why would Homer tell us this in the Iliad? And then he says it again in, in a later line. Face of a dog, but the heart of a deer. So twice he says, dog face. People devouring king. So he's got the face of a dog and he eats people. So he's a cannibal? What? And then there was that one quote. Where was it? Son of Atreus, with what art thou now again discontent, or what lack is thine? Filled are thy huts with bronze. Huts, see, again, closer to tents, rather than cities, castles, whatever. And women, full many are in thy huts. Chosen spoils that we Achaeans give thee first of all, whensoever we take a citadel. Or dost thou still want gold also? This line is very important to me because obviously 
bronze <clears throat> was a defining characteristic of the Achaeans or the people known as the Greeks the Argives and the Hellens and the Mormudons and the whatever there's a catalog of ships which talks about who's coming from where but the point was they had bronze and the Trojans they had gold which makes you really wonder how is it that each only has specific metals rather than all the metals and why is this enough temptation for Agamemnon King of Kings to want to invade, invade Troy for the gold. What is the sig significance of gold in the Iliad? I mean, there are so many questions that arise from this book. But there's also another quote in here. Where is it? It might be under Zeus. Okay, so he is Lord of the Council, he is Aegis Bearing, Palace of Olympus, Thunders on High, King, Son of Kronos, Olympian Zeus, the Cloud Gatherer. Dark brows, ambrosia locks, away from the king's immortal head. Father of men and gods, his wife is Hera, he's the lord of the lightning. He created a dream that he sent to Agamemnon's dreams. Obviously there are elements of, of uh, mind control here, or telepathy. He loves the Achaeans. It's not here either. Dang it. Oh wait, it's right there. It's the very last one. Ha uh ha. -huh. And among them Lord Agamemnon, his eyes and head like unto Zeus that hurleth the thunderbolt, his waist like unto Ares, and his breast unto Poseidon. So this section, very important to me. His eyes and head like unto Zeus that hurleth the thunderbolt. Wait a minute. Didn't you just say earlier dog faced twice? So if his eyes and head are like that of Zeus and he's being referred to as dog faced, does that mean the Zeus has a dog face? Which brings into question. What god known by antiquity has a dog face? Dog face, god. And there's only one that really comes up. Anubis. And if you read about Anubis, you realize this is supposed to be the reincarnated form of Horus. Horus being the one who was killed by Set. Well, Set is Saturn and Horus... Jupiter. It's some it's crazy. It gets crazier and crazier and crazier. And more than that, if you keep reading about Anubis, eventually you get to a point where it talks about um look at that. Recounts another tale where Anubis protected the body of Osiris from Set. Set attempted to attack the body of Osiris by transforming himself into a leopard. Anubis stopped and subdued Set, however, and he branded Set's skin with a hot iron rod. But skin of a leopard? I'm in the process of putting together... Uh, 
Let's just go directly to the Iliad. I'm looking at book three right now. Book three speaks about Alexander. Let's start with line 15. Now when they were come near, as they advanced one host against the other, among the Trojans there stood forth as champion, godlike Alexander, bearing upon his shoulders a panther skin, and his curved bow, and his sword, and brandishing two spears tip of bronze, he challenged all the best of Argives to fight with him face to face in dread combat. Do you see what I'm talking about? Panther skin. Panther skin. Godlike Alexander with panther skin. And then in the very next page, line 38. But Hector saw him and chid him with words of shame. Evil Paris, most fair to look upon. Thou that art mad after women, thou beguiler. Would that thou hadst ne'er been born, and hadst died unwed. I, of that were I fain, and it had been better far than that, that thou shouldest thus be a, I'm sorry, be a reproach, and that men should look upon thee in scorn. Verily, methinks, will the long-haired Achaeans laugh aloud, deeming that a prince is our champion, because the comely form of his is his, while there is no strength in his heart nor any valor. valor. In essence, he is talking about Alexander, but using the name Paris. And I'm like, wait a minute, this pamper skin. Alexander, could he be the same thing as Paris of Troy? So I googled Alexander Paris, and then what appears? For mythology, also known as Alexander. So now you have to wonder all those, all the long lines of Alexanders that existed throughout history. It's like, what? This whole time we've been told that there is Paris of Troy, but we didn't know his alternate name is Alexander. And that the book that spoke about him says that he had a a, a, a leopard skin, which is very similar to the characteristics of what happened between Anubis, Osiris, and Seth. See that? It says, try to attack Osiris by transforming into a leopard. Well, what if Set or Saturn is has qualities like a leopard, physical qualities? So how could that be? How could he possibly have those qualities? And then regarding Anubis, I'm like, is there any other person character from history that could have been this person yes there is hermanubis a combination of hermes and anubis he is the son of set and Nephthys. so wait a minute hermy anubis or Her hermanubis Son of Set, okay, he's Jupiter, but Jupiter is also Anubis. Jupiter is also <clears throat> dog face, like Agamemnon. Ding, 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 ding. Herman Anubis, look at that, a freaking statue of a dog face god. This is Jupiter. <laughs> it just happened. <clears throat> Why? <clears throat> Why are you tripping? 
Stop tripping. Clear as day, right? <clears throat> Anubis. Hermanubis. So Hermes, Anubis, all the same being. Hmm. Jupiter. Zeus. So going back to the relation with Titanomachia. Obviously, Saturn is a Titan. His son, a Titan, but more an Olympian. Battle of the Titans. Yeah, it's one generation versus the other generation. And here we have Zeus representing the Greek side, the Achaean side, in the War of the Trojans. And on the Trojan side, we have this Paris guy who has the skin of a cat, of a big cat, which is talked about in the mythology regarding Anubis and Set and Osiris. More than that, going back to that 10 year time line for Titanomachia. That's also repeated in here, in the Iliad itself. Where was it? Okay. Book two, line three hundred. It was but as yesterday or the day before when the ships of the Achaeans were gathering an Aulus laden with woes for Priam and the Trojans. And we, round about a spring, were offering to the immortals upon the holy altars Hecat tombs that bring fulfillment beneath a fair plane tree from whence flowed the bright waters. Then appeared the great portent, a serpent, blood red on the back, terrible, whom the Olympian himself has said, sent forth to the light gilded from beneath the altar and darted to the plane tree. Now upon this were the younglings of a sparrow, tender little ones, on the topmost bough, cowering beneath the leaves, eight in all, and the uh, mother that bare them was the ninth, that the serpent devoured them as they twittered piteously, and the mother fluttered around them, waiting for her de dear little ones. Howbeit he coiled himself and caught her by the wing as she screamed about him. But when he had devoured the sparrow's little ones, and the mother with the... with the... and the mother with them, 
the God who had brought him to the light made him to be unseen, for the son of crooked counsel and Cronus turned him to stone. Whoa, Jupiter, just like Hermes or Toth, turned to stone. And we stood there and marveled at what was wrought. So when the dread portent breaking upon the hecatombs of the gods, then straightway they called Kas prophecy and addressed our gathering, saying, Why are ye thus silent, ye long haired Achaeans? To us hath Zeus the counselor shewed this great sign, lading coming, lading fulfillment. The The fame whereof shall never perish, even as the serpent devoured the sparrow's little ones and the mother with them, the eighth and the mother that bare them was the ninth, so shall we were there for so many years, but in the tenth shall we take the broad swayed city. On this wise spake Calchas, and now all this is verily being brought to pass. Nay, come abide ye all, ye will grieve the Chians, even where ye are, until we take the great city of Priam. So spake he, and the Argive shouted aloud, Then all round about them the ships echoed wondrously beneath the shouting of the Achaeans, as they praised the words of God like Odysseus. <clears throat> Something happened. In the sky, I think it happened in the sky, where son of crooked counseling Kronos turned him to stone. I think they're talking about entire like planets here. The stars in the sky are just souls without bodies, but when they accumulate a body, isn't that becoming turned to stone? petrification and if it's close enough to the earth wouldn't it imply that it falls down anyways I need to analyze that a lot more including trying to find any old mythology regarding this particular story of the of the serpent blood red on the back eating the younglings of a sparrow eight in total nine with the mother so the trojan war was nine years long just like this example that odysseus spoke of and then in the tenth year is when this final chapter of this war occurred well that's the same thing as titanomachia ten years ten year series of battles and this was a battle between the generations of one generation of gods versus another generation of gods. And this is clearly determined to be true of the Titanomachy because we have the dog faced Agamemnon, who is similar with great Zeus, son of crooked counseling Kronos, also known as Jupiter. Also known as Hermanubis, apparently, because they have a statue of this man back in those days. So, why is the Iliad important? Because it is a chronicle of the greatest battle to determine humanity's fate. A battle in which we do not have modern homo sapiens sapiens just yet we have the Achaeans who are very much like us but we also have characters such as where was you Nestor, Nestor.
He says the following. Uh, he's okay. So he's the king of the third generation of mortal men in Pylos. He witnessed the first two generations, and they pass. He made a reference to the gray warriors from the past generations, such as Periphos and Drias, shepherd of the people, Kyneus and Exadius, and godlike Polyphemus and Theseus, son of Aegeus, a man like the immortals. These were the mightiest, mightiest were these of men reared upon the earth. Mightiest were they, and within the mightiest they fought. The mountain dwelling centaurs. Literally, this man literally uses the word centaurs. Or wait, Homer uses the word centaurs. And they destroyed them terribly. King of Sandy Pilus refers to the gather men as leaders and rulers of the archives, the leaders of the party that met to fight the Trojan War. He is referred to as the horseman, Nestor of Gerenia, more than once. The horseman? Well, that says he's a centaur too, is doesn't it? Doesn't it? Let's do one more. Uh, what was his name? Odysseus. I don't think I put it down there. <laughs> Oh, here we go. Argos. Pasture land of horses. To Argos. Pasture land of Argos. I mean, pasture land of horses. And then we have Ilios, Troy, well walled. And then we have Troy, Troy land, Ilios, deep soil. So what am I trying to point out here? Why am I stuck on the Iliad other than the fact that it pretty much matches up with Titanomachia? It refers to the battle of the gods. It refers to a very crucial chapter in our history that affects the world to today. The main importance is that Beautiful. I like this. We have the tree of life. The tree of life is the vortex in the center of our um, universe, cosmos, solar system. It's in the shape of a torus, and the center part is the tree of life. But not quite, because there are branches that extend in each direction. So what I think was still occurring in the time of the Trojan War was that multiple lands were connected to Earth, kind of through like wormholes, like, or like smaller vortexes. So in other words, you had the light in the sky, which had one physical density, totally different from the density on Earth, 
and then there was a sort of bridge that led to Earth, where whomever came from that side to Earth side had to be bound by the rules of Earth physics or physicality. So they gained blood and flesh, if that makes sense. So if on their if 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 on their home world it's a world of intelligent cats, leopards, lions, when they came here they took on the qualities of leopards and lions. If their world was of a cow or bulls, oxen, whatever, they took on the qualities of bulls and oxen when they got here. And the same applied to all the animals. And then at some point, somehow, <clears throat> one of these worlds brought forth people, or what looks like people. And then another point, somehow, people from different locations, I mean different worlds, got together and made it. And that's how all kinds of hybrids were born. So in other words, in the ocean, especially where the Greek islands are at, those lands were the end result of a bridge coming from another world. And all these lands, even though they were side by side, they were totally alien from each other. I hope that made sense. Now, how could that even occur? It can occur if you interpret everything as being alive. <laughs> and it's all a, literally just a subject of scale. And since I was talking about centaurs and the horseman and swift-footed Achilles, we must know there was a centaur in Ikea, or Battle of the Centaurs. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, I guess it is known. Look at this. Schigliano suggests that. Michelangelo's Battle of the Centaurs also reflects the themes of Greeks over barbarians and civilization over savagery. savagery. But in Michelangelo's work, he sees in addition the triumph of stone over flesh. What? Petrification? What? He notes that in the work itself, Michelangelo depicts his combatants using rocks against one another and suggests that the sculptor could not have missed the coincidence that the name of the human fighters, Lapith, reflects the Latin word for stone, lapis, and the Italian word for stone plague, lapide. Whoa, okay. So, who are these lapiths? You gotta know who the lapiths are. A legendary group of people in Greek mythology whose home was in Thessaly. Oh shit, isn't that the War of the Titans, the Talamachia? Didn't it happen in Thessaly? In the valley of the Peneus and the mountain Pelion? Ooh. This is important. They were an Aeolo Aeolian tribe. Like the Mermudons and other Thessalian tribes, the Lapiths were natives of Thessaly. The genealogists made them a kindred people with the Centaurs. In one version, Lapithas and Centaurus were said to be the twin sons of the god Apollo and the nymph Stilbe, daughter of the river god Peneus. Lapithas was a valiant warrior, but Centaurus was a deformed being who later made it with mares from whom the race of half-men, half-horse centaurs then came. 
Lapithus was the eponymous ancestor of the Lapith people, and his descendants include Lapith warriors and kings such as Ixion, Piri, Phaus, Caeneus, and Coronus, and the seers Ampicus and his son Mopsus. In the Iliad, the Lapith sent 40 men ship to join the Greek fleet in the Trojan War. Yes, I remember reading that. But the point being here is, you have two brothers, one called Lapithus and one called Centaurus. One is, one is, the father of the centaurs and one is the father of a group of people that have horse blood in them so centaurus is 50 percent man 50 percent well i'm not sure what man meant back in those days anymore but he was he had the same blood flowing through him that this Lapithus guy did. And this Lapithus guy is portrayed as having more human characteristics. So when Achilles or the Myrmidons are referred to as swift-footed, initially I thought it would be like a centaur. But based on reading this Lapithus versus Centaurus twin brothers Wikipedia description, I realized, wait a minute, he could, Achilles could have been a, la, a Lapith. But a little bit different. So either he's a Centaur, either Achilles is a Centaur or a Lapith. Other option is crazy. If he's a Lapith, does that mean that he has like horse features and I don't know, his head, his feet, his hands, his chest, his private parts? <laughs> As if it was, it would be like the biggest. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Mirina. Queen of the Amazons, trying to understand this character has led me on the journey of trying to understand the Iliad. And before I can really speak about chapter 3 analysis, I intend to finish putting together a proper presentation on the Iliad. Because if you were listening just now, there are several events that occurred that are spoken about in this Homer's Titanomachia that are very crucial to understanding why our world is the way it is today. So in essence, before free travel to the entire universe or everyone and this plane, earth plane, was the, was the middle ground where all the worlds could come. And ever since son of Crooked Council, Kronos, Zeus, took control, ever since possibly this Titanomachia or Gigantomachia, our connections to the other worlds are gone. But are, are they really gone? What just happened? So, <laughs> coffee time. So, when I go to Romania and I explore the mountains, you bet your ass I'm looking for tombs, just like Densu Shan was speaking in chapter 3 about. However, it's crucial that I understand the Iliad properly before I can even start researching the mountains. Because, yeah, I could show up on the hillock 
Oh look, it's round. Oh look, it looks manly. Oh, I should just dig a hole to the center. Oh, if I get there, I'm gonna get to a Palachian tomb. Oh, if I get to a Palachian tomb, I'm bound to find some gold. That's what I'm thinking, right? But wait a minute. What if... What if the entire Pala my entire notion of what it means to be Pelagian is different now? What if representatives from many worlds came and Pelagian is just a generic word for people that look like centaurs or lapids or horse faced or bull faced or fish faced or sheep faced or pig faced? See what I'm saying? If multiple groups of people could potentially have been buried, then I need to be looking for different things. Not just one universal, oh, Pelagian, Doliko, Cephali skull. And what's more important, and if there's anything you got out of this video other than the connection with the Titanomachia, it's this. I hope you understand everyone that is alive today and exhibits qualities that define people from antiquity that looked differently. So for example, when you think of Agamemnon, the bad guy on the Greek side, He's got the face of a dog. Well, if you think of a dog, especially man-devouring dog, that's a vicious, evil dog, okay? A dog today of that nature would be like a pit bull. A pit bull is very aggressive and would attack me. It has attacked me. But then there are also people that exhibit the qualities of an aggressive dog. You know who these people are. And there are people that exhibit the qualities of a pig through how much they eat, how big they are. There are people who exhibit the qualities of cats based on how jumpy they are, scared, skittish. Is that the right word? Skittish? <laughs> there are noble people. Nobles. Like those that are upholding the truth. Standing for what is right. So my point is. Before there was man and animals. Animals was also man. And they all could talk to each other. All of them. But not anymore. Something changed. Something changed. We'll figure it out.